Today, we're going over the most brutal stories of revenge in human history. Number one, Olga and the Drevlians. We're starting this list with quite possibly one of the greatest ride-or-die stories in human history, when Olga of Kiev led one of the most terrifying and calculated tours of revenge following the brutal execution of her husband. It's the year 945, and Prince Igor is ruling over Kiev and Rus, an empire that once stretched over modern-day Ukraine, Bulgaria, and a bit of Russia. To his west lived the Drevlians, a tribe who actually kind of hated the Kievan Rus, but occasionally fought alongside them against the Byzantine Empire. When Igor's father Oleg dies in 912, the Drevlians see it as an opportunity to finally stop paying their tribute, aka their forced protection money, to these assholes in Kiev. Igor patiently waits for his money for 33 years until finally deciding, you know what? 34 years would be just too long and personally travels to the Drevlian capital city of Korostin to collect his money himself. He rode into the city with a large army and demanded tribute, which the Drevlians begrudgingly paid. And that should have been the end of it, and Igor should have gone on to live a long, happy life. But on his ride home, he feels the tribute was just a little too small, so he turns around with a few of his men and heads back to Korostin to demand more. When Igor arrives back at the city and begins shouting his demands, the Drevlians surprisingly do not like this and immediately kill his men. Igor was saved for an extra horrific execution. The Drevlians bent two birch trees toward each other and tied one of Igor's legs to each tree. Once Igor's legs were fastened, they cut the supports and the trees snapped back to their original form, ripping Igor into two pieces. The Drevlian's ruler, Prince Mal, was now feeling pretty good about himself and set his sights on taking over the larger empire by marrying Igor's widow, Olga. And this is where things all went downhill for the Drevlians, because Olga, she was the wrong person to mess with. Prince Mal sends 20 of his best ambassadors to Kiev to inform Olga what had happened to her husband and to propose that she marry him to combine their territory. Surprisingly, she seems to take this news well, and tells the messengers that they should go back to their boat to rest for now, and that tomorrow, her men would bring them back to the city to get her. The next morning, Olga's men walk down to the shore to get the ambassadors, but instead of just leading them into the city, they pick up their entire boat with all 20 men still in it. The ambassadors are blown away by this hospitality. What service? They're being treated like royalty! Until the ride suddenly got really bumpy. See, all through the night, Olga had her men digging a huge trench, and when her men arrived with the Drevlian ambassadors, she ordered them to dump the boat and all the men on board into this huge hole. She then orders them to bury these messengers alive. The Drevlians can do nothing as dirt is slowly piled on them, and soon they're buried alive. But Olga was just getting started. She then sends her own messengers to Koristin to ask Prince Mal to send his most distinguished men to Kiev to escort his soon-to-be bride. The Drevlians, not knowing what happened to the first group, comply and send a party of lords and powerful men as escorts. When they arrive in Kiev, Olga tells these distinguished guests to relax in a bathhouse her men had prepared and that she would meet with them after they've freshened up. Her men lead the Drevlian nobles to the bathhouse and once they're in, her men lock the doors and set the bathhouse and all the men inside on fire. Olga then sends more messengers to Koristin, asking Prince Mal to prepare for her arrival. She has one request. She wants a feast to mourn her late husband before the marriage. The Drevlians, again, not really knowing what's going on in Kiev, prepare a grand feast for Olga. She arrives, the party begins, and she encourages the Drevlians to drink and mourn with her. They do, and by the end of the night, the Drevlians are all properly hammered. Olga then orders her men to begin killing the now drunk and defenseless Drevlians. Surprise! Her men were sandbagging their drinks the whole night and were stone cold sober. Historians say Olga was seen cheering her men on as they went around slaughtering thousands of Drevlians, including Prince Mal himself. Olga then returned to Kiev to raise an army to finish them off once and for all. The Drevlians finally catch the hint that Olga maybe wasn't too fond of them when she returned to Koristin with a massive army and began a siege on the city. For over a year, the citizens of Koristin suffered with little food or supplies, until finally Olga sends a message saying basically, if you just pay your tribute, this can all be over. Having been already fooled three times, and not really wanting to be fooled again, the Drevlians say they will pay the tribute, but are scared that Olga will still kill them. She responds and was like, Oh, I know I got a little crazy there after Igor, but it's fine now! Just send me three pigeons and three sparrows from each house, and I'll go away. 
The Drevlians think this is a weird request, but are so relieved that their nightmare is finally coming to an end that they quickly go out and find the birds to give her. That night, Olga has her men tie a small piece of sulfur bundled in cloth to each bird's leg. They set fire to the cloth and release the birds into the night. Olga and her men watch a thousand tiny embers fly off into the distance and the birds go straight to their nests built on buildings in Koristan. Within hours, the entire city is a fiery hellscape. Olga watched the city burn to the ground and later claimed all Drevlian territory for herself. So yeah, they really should have just paid the tribute. Number 2. Caesar and the Pirates This next story is one where I actually feel kind of a little sorry for the would-be bad guys. It's the year 75 BCE, and a 25-year-old Roman nobleman named Julius Caesar was sailing the Aegean Sea heading to Rhodes. Along the way, his ship is boarded by Sicilian pirates, and Julius is taken captive. Now, becoming a hostage is usually a terrifying situation for most people, but in this case, I think the pirates knew right from the start they might have made a huge mistake. The pirates take a look at Caesar with his fancy clothes and entourage and realize he's probably somebody important, so they set a ransom for 20 talents, worth around $2 million today, give or take a million. When Caesar hears this number, he's offended and demands that they up the ransom to 50 talents. He sends his entourage to gather the money to buy his freedom, and he would remain as the pirates hostage until they came back with the money. The pirates then sail off with Caesar and just a few of his men to their island hideout. Now, aboard the pirate ship, Caesar simply refuses to be a prisoner. In fact, the entire time he's held hostage, he acts as if they were all on his ship and these pirates are his men. He freely walks around the ship, eats with the pirates, joins in on their games, and even exercises with them. He shushes them to be quiet when they're being noisy, and every day he forces them to listen to the speeches and poems he's working on. And that is why the Senate's power is but an illusion maintained merely by tradition and weak men. Rome needs a leader who can see beyond petty politics and guide her to true greatness, perhaps even by force if necessary. You guys are all f***ing idiots, aren't you? <laughs> the pirates were confused as they never had a prisoner behave in such a strange way, but they put up with Caesar because he was kind of charismatic and he was also kind of their ticket to a huge payday. It's also worth mentioning that throughout his time as a hostage, Caesar would joke that one day he would crucify them all for this. Once you guys let me go, I'm going to find you guys and crucify every single one of you. <laughs> I'm totally serious. You're all going to be so sorry. <laughs> 38 days later, Caesar's men return with the 50 talents and Caesar is set free. The pirates sail back to their island base with their huge jackpot to get drunk having achieved financial independence. Caesar, however, did no such relaxing, and immediately he goes out, raises a small army, and sails right back to the pirate's island. He takes back the 50 talents his men had just given them for the ransom, and captures every single one of the pirates who held him captive. Caesar then crucified all of them, just like he promised. To Caesar's credit, he actually did grow a little fond of these pirates, so he slit their throats first to prevent them from suffering for a long time. What a nice guy. Number 3. The 47 Ronin we go from pirates who were too dumb to know what was coming, to a story of extreme loyalty when 47 samurai patiently waited for two years to avenge the death of their fallen master. This story begins in 1701 with two young daimyo named Kame and Asano, and a man named Kira, a member of the shogun's court tasked with instructing the two young lords in proper etiquette. Now, Kira, he was a giant douchebag, but because he was close to the shogun, he basically could get away with anything. The story goes that when Kame and Asano traveled to Edo, the two young lords brought gifts, aka bribes, that Kira felt were not big enough. So Kira pretty much spends every day calling them names and overall being a giant asshole. Both young lords were not used to being treated so poorly, but Asano does his best to maintain his composure. Kame, on the other hand, can't take it and decides to assassinate Kira himself. His counselors catch wind of this plan and behind Kame's back pay Kira a huge bribe for him to stop. With this, Kira unknowingly saves his own life, and he begins to treat Kame much better. Asano, on the other hand, never got the memo about the bribe thing, and so Kira, now left with only one target, ramped up his insults in his direction. One fateful day, while walking together in Edo Castle, Kira is still running his mouth calling Asano a country hick with no manners. Asano finally snaps. He pulls out a knife and slashes at Kira, trying to shut him up for good, but he only manages to cut Kira's face before he's quickly stopped by castle guards. Drawing a weapon within Edo Castle was a serious crime, and Asano is quickly arrested. 
His lands are seized, and he's ordered to commit seppuku, the samurai's bloody ritual of disembowelment. Back in his domain, Asano's family loses everything, and his samurai, now masterless, are left to find their way as ronin. Kira receives no punishment and gets off nearly scot-free with just a scar on his face. Now, Kira was a prick, but he was no idiot. He knew that Asano had very loyal samurai who would probably try to defend the honor of their fallen lord, so he hires extra security and sends out spies and ninjas to track every move of the now masterless samurai. Over the next year, Asano's men seemed to move on with their lives the best they could. In this period of peace, there wasn't much demand for samurai, so they took up normal jobs. They became carpenters, blacksmiths, and merchants. The leader of Asano's men, Oishi, seemed to take the fall from grace exceptionally hard, and he began drinking heavily and visiting brothels in Kyoto. He even divorces his wife and sends his family away so he could be miserable alone. Another year passes, and much to Kira's relief, none of Asano's men seem to be interested in revenge. He reduces the number of guards at his home and assumes he's in the clear. But it turns out, Kira was dead wrong. As in the darkness of night on January 31st, 1703, 47 of Asano's former samurai quietly surround his home in Edo. Asano's men had in fact not moved on. For two years, they had been secretly plotting their revenge against Kira and crafted an elaborate plan to defend the honor of their fallen master. Going their separate ways, taking up normal jobs, even Oishi, the actual leader of the group, acting like a drunk, was all part of an elaborate multi-year plan to fool Kira into letting his guard down. The group had stayed in contact the whole time through coded messages, and every detail of the night was planned and accounted for. Before the attack, the ronin visit Kira's neighbors and tell them they're not burglars, simply samurai seeking to defend the honor of their fallen lord. There would be no danger for anyone else. Unsurprisingly, all of Kira's neighbors hated him too, and no one did anything to stop them. The ronin take out the perimeter guards, and Oishi sends archers to climb onto Kira's roof as lookouts. With everything in place, the assault begins. Oishi beats a drum to signal his men to attack, and a group under his command storm the front of the house while another group led by his 16-year-old son storm the rear. Oishi's son breaks through first, but is quickly joined by Oishi's group. The house erupts into a bloody battle, with the ronin cutting down Kira's guards left and right. Kira's men soon realize they're no match for these samurai, and they try to send messengers to the shogun, but anyone who leaves the house is quickly shot down by the archers on the roof. The ronin subdue 38 men, who are now either dead or seriously injured, but Kira himself is nowhere to be found. All hope seemed lost, until they check his bed. It's still warm, meaning Kira couldn't have gotten far. The men continue to search, until they find a secret passage behind a scroll that leads outside. Inside a small storehouse in the courtyard, the ronin find a man cowering in the corner with a small dagger who attacks them. The samurai quickly capture this man and call for Oishi, who, using the light of a lantern, finally sees the scar that Asano had left on Kira's head two years ago, confirming this man's identity. Oishi bends down to his knees and respectfully tells Kira that they're simply samurai who are fulfilling their duties to their master. He explains that they'll allow him an honorable death by seppuku and hands Kira the same dagger their fallen lord Asano had used to do the same. Kira just sits there trembling, and no matter how nicely Oishi asks him to get it over with, he does nothing. Eventually, realizing this was taking way too long, Oishi grabs the dagger and cuts off Kira's head himself. As the sun rises, the ronin begin the six-mile journey with Kira's head to the tomb of their master at Sengakuji Temple. Along the way, word quickly spreads through the city of what had just happened, and many townsfolk who are just waking up begin running outside cheering for the samurai and offering them gifts and food as they pass. The sleepless ronin arrive at the temple and present Kira's head and Asano's dagger before their master's tomb, fulfilling their final duty of defending his honor. They then turn themselves in to authorities, knowing that the crimes they had committed would ultimately lead to their executions as well. The shogun was now caught in a sticky situation. These ronin were criminals, as they basically went on a murder rampage to kill one of his men. But they were also following the code of Bushido and defending the honor of their master. He ultimately decides that while the men needed to be punished, they could do so with dignity, and he allowed the ronin to commit seppuku, a more honorable death. The ronin were then interred in graves surrounding their master, which can still be visited today. Number 4. Chinggis Khan and the Khwarezmid Empire This last story is probably history's greatest example of f*** around and find out. And like most things involving Genghis Khan, the death toll in this revenge story is crazy, so let's get right into it. 
In 1218, Chinggis Khan sends a caravan of 450 merchants and traders to the Khwarezmian city of Otrar, hoping to expand his trade network to the west. The merchants arrive and are immediately executed by the governor of the city, a man named Inalchuk, who then steals all of the goods brought by the merchants and sells them to members of high society in the city of Bukhara. One camel driver from the caravan manages to escape, and he returns to Mongolia to tell Chinggis what had happened. Pissed off, but trying to keep his cool, Chinggis sends another small group of diplomats, one Muslim and two Mongolians, to the Shah Muhammad himself, the ruler of the Khwarezmian Empire, to negotiate peace. All the Shah has to do is let them take Inalchuk back to Mongolia for punishment, and everything would be all good. But instead of giving up Inalchuk, the Shah Uno reverses the envoy and kills the Muslim diplomat. He then shaves the beard of the Mongolians, which was the ultimate form of disrespect in their culture, and sends them back to Chinggis. Okay, let's see. Fuck around. Check. Now it's time to find out. Chinggis is now furious, and he quickly raises an army of 200,000 men to crush Khwarezmia. They're not messing around, and the Mongolians attack multiple cities at once. Two of Chinggis' sons, Chagatai and Ogadai, lead a siege on Otrar to capture Inalchuk. And Chinggis personally goes to Bukhara to punish those who had taken his goods. The Mongols use new siege weapons they collected in China, and soon the walls of Bukhara are destroyed, and Chinggis rides into the heart of the city. Chinggis loudly proclaims to the citizens that he was sent by God as punishment for their sins. He then orders his men to slaughter everyone in the city, only sparing artisans and craftsmen, which he took as slaves, and young able-bodied men, which he took as human shields for further battles. Meanwhile, his sons were busy at work trying to crack Otrar. After five months of suffering, a general within the city realizes it's hopeless and decides to defect with a few thousand of his men and join the Mongols. He opens the city gates and rushes to join his new Mongolian brothers. But it turns out the Mongols don't really like traitors no matter which side they're on, and they kill the general and his men themselves. With the gates wide open, they ride into Otrar and capture Inalchuk, who fights to the end even throwing bricks and roof tiles as a desperate last attempt when he runs out of weapons. Some stories say that Inalchuk was brought to Chinggis and as punishment for his greed, he had his men pour molten silver into Inalchuk's eyes and ears. After this, Chinggis and his forces went on to destroy every city in the Khwarezmian Empire. Shah Muhammad spends the rest of his life running from the Mongols until he dies of pneumonia on a tiny island in the Caspian Sea. At the end of this revenge tour, the Khwarezmian Empire was gone, and Chinggis had massacred an estimated 15 million people. To put it in perspective, that's about the population of New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago combined.